keeping short song for us instead of the video. Take it away, Emily. find ecologies for me and you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining. We haven't, uh, we were talking off screen that we've talked about permaculture. We've talked about gardening. We've talked about farming, but we haven't had anyone to talk directly about the importance of bees. And I know that is your passion. So thank you yeah. so much for joining. It's great to be here. Awesome. All unintended. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're going to use lots of puns today, I, I foresee. <laughs> uh, would you like to just start by introducing yourself a little bit? Sure, sure. Um, so my name is Emily. I'm currently living in Hokkaido. And I'm based at Hokkaido University in Sydney University, researching bees, especially native bees, and the amazing diversity of bees we have. And I often work in urban environments, so looking at bees in cities and the connection between bees, people, community, cities, permaculture, education. And so do a bunch of projects which can seem really unrelated but they're all connected to bees and community gardens I guess would be the things that come together yeah and and your website um is let's be scientists right yeah. yes uh so I think uh it's really important that uh we empower ourselves and empower our communities to be the scientists that we want to be uh, it's when um, communities are learning together and we're doing citizen science, that is science by people, uh, and we're learning about the nature around, we're documenting the species that are around, that's when we can really understand our local environment and our ecology and everyone can be a scientist when we have the tools and the empowerment to do so. Can you, it looks like you've done a lot of programs with um, school kids. Can you run us through some of the projects you've done with them? Sure, sure. So a project that I really love doing, um, this was back in Sydney, Australia, was called Let's Be Scientists, and that's where the name evolved from. Uh, and that was really amazing working with these high school students who, for the first time, they designed and co-created this a science experiment per se. So in order to learn about science and to learn about pollinators and bees, uh, they made these artificial flowers and tested which pollinators were coming, which insects were coming in the community gardens. And then they facilitated the primary schoolers and their families to do the field work to then go through the scientific process and actually be like real scientists. Uh, in learning about science, doing the science, and being autonomous in terms of that project. And we learned so much about bees and pollinators, um, but what was really beautiful was that it was these high school students that were really taking ownership over their learning and over their being ambassadors for, for ecology and for bees. On the screen right now, I'm showing uh, children around in a circle. It looks like an adult is helping guide them. Uh, they're doing some kind of data chart. Like what kind of things were they looking at and collecting data about? Ah, oh, sure. So um, over, so we were doing a particular big field day in the local community garden. And there we had 17 replicates. And a replicate in ecology is a different, um, uh, an extra station where you act a little piece of science and so little groups came together and they were surveying which bees flies and wasps were coming to their flowers that they made and by knowing over like 10 minutes which bees and flies and wasps were there we could get a much greater understanding and a more robust like reliable way of knowing um, which insects were in that environment in different spaces to different replicate um, flowers. So what did they make the flowers out of? Was it paper? 
Uh, so the final design that we went with, um, there were two stages to this experiment. I don't remember, I'm not sure which photo you're looking at at the moment, but the first round the high school students had total free roam. So we went and observed different flowers around and we looked at the shape and the color, the smells, and through their observations, they were then trying to make flowers that would attract different pollinators. So I think they used like plastic plates and paper and a random array of craft materials. Uh, and what they came up with was so creative and playful. And then in the next round of the experiment, we try to hone it in and think about, okay, well, which colors are they gonna go to? Is it gonna be yellow or blue? Uh, does the size matter? Those kinds of more um, uh, testable uh, pieces. Did you use like any sugar or honey to attract them or was it just about shape and color? Ah, uh, so we actually did put a little um, Eppendorf tube, like just a small tube and put a little bit of sugar mixed with water in it to attract them. Um, in these kinds of experiments, you don't actually need to have the sugar water, but it does make them come faster. <laughs> um, and so we, we really wanted to see something. Yeah. So we put that little bit of sugar water there. It would, it would be <laughs> too depressing for the kids to work so hard and then no bees would come, right? And it is the hardest <laughs> part of science. It's yeah. the groups that saw nothing, that saw no one. Yeah. But like, oh, this is really boring. And it can be, it can be really hard. So working through those challenges is all part of learning the process of science, which is really, it can be hard, but it, it's a challenge that's worth trying. Yeah, for sure. Um, in your Instagram, you had an article in a Japanese, it looks like maybe Sapporo newspaper, where they did an article about you. So you, you said in your Instagram that this is kind of like, a Japanese version of your journey or your ecological journey. So can you tell us about the same kind of journey in English? Uh, sure, sure. So the newspaper article that came out um, in the Hokkaido Shimbun, in the Hokkaido newspaper, um, was really framed around the intersection between um, music and science. And so I realized a long time ago that no one's going to read my thesis. Um, it's going to be really long. It's going to be lots of science jargon in it. Uh, I'd like to think it's really fun and I've put a lot of work into it. But um, by synthesizing what we're learning together into ways that are creative uh, and musical, it can reach a lot more people. So two years ago, a little bit over two years ago, I started writing what I was researching in the field with people in kind of condensing months and months and months of research into four minute songs. <laughs> and so the newspaper article is really about that journey of thinking about uh, science and ecology and learning about bees and their amazingness, uh, but communicating that through song and how that can be a much more accessible way to, to reach people and really fun as well. Yeah. Have you... Have you found that that music, especially for children, music is a much better way to communicate the complexities of pollination or the, the difficult science part? Uh, your uh, YouTube video of the ABC karaoke, where you're, <laughs> you're explaining pollination, um, do you want to explain it or you want to sing a little bit of it so people who haven't heard can understand what we're talking about abc song because i will never turn that one down but if i'm gonna sing it i'm gonna have to put on my b outfit you have um, to it's a must. it's a must i think it's obligatory um, so, so as you mentioned and you can see this um video we recorded the background that i've got at the moment is where we recorded this music video um but the idea is it's an alphabet song explaining pollination oh you can't see my antenna that's what happens when you've got the i've got still got the eyes though um, I do have a bee, a bee tail on. You can't see it in the studio. That's fine. Um, but the idea for this song is it's an alphabet song to explain this complex jargon about bees and pollination and the diversity of bees. Uh, and all the words, all the alphabet words as we go from A to Z are pointing out some really key moments. 
uh, and I'd like to think it's playful and explains a lot, but I have heard that it, it's a sing a bit fast, so maybe you have to listen to it about 20 times on YouTube before I actually catch all the words. <laughs> I've got a tinsy bit of a tuning issue, so maybe can you can you uh, just chat a little bit for a second whilst I just fix sure. the tune? I'm just putting up screenshots of the video now, and you can see the words um, about pollination, which you've put on the video. Um, so if anybody finds Amelia Ecology on YouTube, uh, you can watch this for yourself and see all the words. Thank you. Tuning's all right. Okay, <laughs> good. Buzzly. 
Fantastic. Sure. <laughs> so I guess in that song and um what I really want to highlight from it is that we do have over 20,000 species of bees in the world uh, and that we're not just talking about honeybees, we're not just talking about bees that make honey, but we're talking about this incredible diversity of pollinators. Um, and I didn't even talk about the flies and wasps that do amazing work as well. But it's thanks to these creatures that we um, can eat everything on our plate pretty much. I think if we didn't have bees, we'd have a very plain diet of just rice um, and all our fruits, vegetables, nuts, all that high nutrition, all those colourful foods, they're thanks to insect pollinators. Uh, so so it's really, I want to celebrate bees and other pollinators, um, celebrate the diversity, uh, and also think a little bit about the fact that because they have different um, needs, uh, most of our bees live in the ground. Most of our bees are solitary, which means they don't live in these big hives of the queen bee. Um, that they have very um, specific needs that when we're um, throwing about uh, pesticides and we're chopping down uh, trees and forests that our bees are also and our other pollinators are suffering and so that's what's causing a lot of um, the problems with bee declines in the world uh, so I tried to summarize that in four minutes <laughs> I think you I think you did pretty good and it's a nice catchy tune um when did your journey begin when did your love for bees or love for nature when did this start can you like pinpoint a time or a trip or something that happened that sparked this in you um my grandma likes to tell me uh, about how whenever we would go for a walk I just kind of disappear after a while and she'd be like, don't worry, it's fine. She's just following an ant looking for its nest. Um, and I was always constantly following the insects and asking questions and being curious. And I think that's something that um, children are really strong at. I think children are really good ecologists because we're always asking questions and curious. And so I think I just never lost that. I just never lost that curiosity and I maintained it. Uh, bees in particular, I was always fascinated by insects, but I really chose bees as a research topic quite intentionally uh, because I wanted to find something that could really uh, connect uh, a passion for community, for community work, especially in cities and um, these insects and thinking about pollination and how much we really rely upon each other felt like a really good place to start. Yeah, yeah. I, I was really interested to see um, all of the hive workshops that you've done in Japan and Australia. So can you tell us a bit about building hives? Like you don't you don't actually need very expensive materials. It looks like. Can you run us through? Totally. Yeah. So. Um... So um, as I mentioned briefly, most of our bees are solitary, which means that there's uh, one strong single mama bee and she will wake up in spring and uh, find a mate and they'll have a little bit of a hoo-ha and then she will find, she will make a nest and uh, she'll lay a few eggs. By this point, the, the male bee's gone. He's, you know, in another, in another world. Um, she'll make a nest and lay a few eggs, maybe up to five, depending on the species. And then uh, she will go out and do, uh, she'll collect pollen and nectar. And she'll make a little onigiri, a little, um, a little rice ball type um, structure. And she'll place it next to the egg. So that, and then she'll seal that up at the end. And then, so we're not talking about huge hives of 20,000 honeybees. Um, they don't even make honey. Uh, we're talking about just a few eggs of like one staunch single mama bee that she's caring for. So the next spring, uh, the babies will uh, wake up, they'll eat their onigiri, and they'll go out into the world again, and they'll start a new generation. And when we think of the majority, 90% of our bees live in this type of way, often tunneling into the ground and into trees, into hollow stems. Um, they're the kind of nests that um, that we're making. So in Australia, it's um, native bees have become this huge hot thing and bee hotel workshops are a really exciting educational tool. 
And so, uh, yeah, by using just bits of bamboo and drilling into wood, you can make a similar environment to what these native bees will live in. Uh, there are these kinds of bees, um, heaps of these kinds of bees that also live in Japan. Uh, but the, the idea of bee hotels isn't really taken off here like it has in Australia. Uh, but it's not a, re a replacement for conserving the natural habitat is something I want to mention. So I use it as an educational tool and a craft tool, um, but really conserving their native habitat is the best thing we can do. Yeah, I visited a bee farmer in uh, Hiroshima, in Miyajima Island, last mm -hmm. year, and I was really surprised how uh, he was talking about the importance of bees for a sustainable forest that Miyajima Island is so famous for its trees and its nature, its mountains. And he was talking about the bees are a very key part of keeping forests and trees healthy. Now, I think all of us, we think of uh, things that they like to use for pollination, just being flowers or pretty things that they're attracted to. I was really surprised about the forest thing. So it's it's more complicated, I think, than most people realize, maybe, about the importance of bees. Totally, yeah. And it, it raises a really um, good point in that um, often we think of bees and we think of honeybees and we think of these, these insects living in boxes. But um, bees, like, naturally, they don't live in boxes. They live in the forest. They live in the trees. They live in the ground. They live in little little stems lying around. And so this kind of messy, like native natural spaces is, is their hunting ground. And so that, that um, a bee farmer in Miyajima, um, he, he touches on something really important in that that's the wild, that those forests are the places where those bees are living. But also it's because of those bees that those flowering trees are being pollinated. Because they're not just pollinating our food, they're pollinating um, all sorts of flowering plants as well. So they really um, rely on each other. Yeah, we have uh, some nice comments. Uh, John Walsh says, Amelia, you rock. And the red mercury files free the budgie bee smugglers. Fly free like the wind, Mr. Abbott. It must be an inside joke, perhaps. Definitely an inside Australian <laughs> joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's something when I visited Australia, I was really surprised how little I understood of a normal conversation. That you guys have your own slang language is yeah. quite strong. <laughs> uh, I love it. Um, let's talk a little bit about your recent travels. You did a SDG tour of Hokkaido. Let's hear about it. Sure, sure. So, um, uh, yeah, recently, uh, my friend Mika and I, and also my friend Adam, uh, we wanted to travel a little bit around Hokkaido and do it in a way that was, um, sensitive to, uh, coronavirus at the time. And, and and respectful of the communities living there, um, but also a way that was able to foster um, connections. Uh, and so being mindful of all that 2020 brings, um, we, uh, my friend Adan and I, she's from Okinawa and another singer-songwriter. And uh, we both went up to Daebun Island. So Hokkaido is this kind of, this kind of like kite shape. And we went right to the top up to Wakanai. We, if it was a sunny day, we would have seen Siberia. It wasn't a sunny day, so we couldn't see Siberia, but we imagined it. And then we jumped, hopped on a ferry and we went to this Northern Island. And, uh, the, the theme of, of our tour, it was a kind of a song writing, listening, uh, performing, connecting tour was the idea, was around SDG, Sustainable Development Goals. Now, I've got an automatic screen, so I don't know if it'll work. Ooh, not, not my face disappeared. Um, but the idea is that there are these 17 uh, sustainable development goals set by the United Nations. Um, and I'd never really heard of them or connected with them much until I came to Japan. But in Japan, it seems like a really big deal. Um, there's advertisements about it everywhere. Um, and, and for me, they really... 
they just communicate some of the essentials of permaculture, which are people care, earth care, and fair share. So when we're trying to do anything sustainable in our life, if we're thinking about how it contributes to community, equality, and our environment, then we're probably going to be doing a good job. And so we use these these SDGs, um, of which there are 17. Uh, and in thinking about ideas of achieving zero hunger, of gender equality, of resp responsible consumption, of climate action, of life on land, all these concepts, we wanted to listen to the communities, uh, listen to the people that we were meeting, uh, listen to the land, listen to the ocean, and um, create songs from those stories and also be able to perform and share uh, along the way. Uh, and there are so many stories that came from this. We went up to Raven and then over to the city and then we worked our way slowly around East Hokkaido. Um, and there's, there's one moment that I really want to um, highlight, which was in Nakatombetsu. So in Hokkaido is this crazy big rural space um, with a big bang city of Sapporo in the middle, but the rest is pretty much cows and trees. Um, cows and trees surrounded by ocean. Um, and we went to Nakatombetsu. And this is, it's just cows and trees. Like it is, we're talking really rural. And we were invited by this amazing woman, um, Yukiko-san, who owns a sento, uh, um, ofuro, uh, the English word is bathhouse. <laughs> um, uh, and in this tiny little community, uh, this bathhouse has become this community centre. And I often, I always work with community gardens and the community part of the community garden is really important to me. Um, but what she created with this bathhouse was a space where people would just kind of trickle in um, with their kind of daily bathing routine with their families and then meet each other. They'd have a coffee. They might have a bite to eat. Uh, and just it was this constant trickle, people are meeting each other. And it is the hub of this community. There was this, this Finnish couple that when I asked, hey, why did you move to Nakatombetsu? They're like, the community, like this 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 bathhouse um and it really reminded and all these people are they're living sustainable lives uh this bathhouse is wood fired it uses no electricity it is fully wood fired um and these people are living incredible sustainable rural lives and they're connecting with each other and they're not talking about sustainability or sustainability living because that's just who they are and what they're doing and so all the stories of these people and the informal jams and the, the music and the performance and the sharing uh, just really, it just really brought all these sustainable development goals together for me um, and reminded me of how important those community hubs are because that's where everything starts. Yeah, that was a really big highlight of the tour. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. And it, to have those experiences while you're traveling around, I think mm -hmm. is, a, is a powerful way to see Japan and to experience the culture, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. And it was, it was always, we'd go to one place and then they'd suggest, you know, where to go next. And then they would have a friend in the next town. We were just kind of like popping along. And um, yeah, that's this kind of community way of, of connecting and traveling, but also being able to share the music as a gift in exchange for all the, incredible meals ah! <laughs> that these beautiful people were creating for us yeah that's wonderful uh years ago many years ago now my husband and I well now husband boyfriend at the time and I uh after we were jets for three years in Kyushu we decided to travel around Asia but before that we took six weeks and we cycled around Hokkaido ah! and we we're both vegetarian um, but there were such incredible vegetables everywhere. Like Hokkaido is an amazing agriculture place. Um, you can get the most incredible potatoes. And, you know, like sometimes, because we were cycling around, sometimes we would actually find huge, beautiful pieces of corn on the side of the road that fell <laughs> off a truck. You know? And we're like, yes! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Wait. then, and then, as you're cycling around, you can also see the the honesty shops. I love those. Yeah, right? yeah. like in the rural areas, 
you see the local vegetables from the field nearby and nobody's there. It has a price and it has a box and you're just supposed to put your coins in. And I love that about cycling around Hokkaido. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And that was another part of our trip was that um, everything we ate or as much as possible, um, we wanted it to be like locally sourced and we wanted to have some kind of connection with the person who had um, grown or fished that food. So we, um, this area is really famous for seafood. Um, I have a, mm, like I have lots of ups and downs about whether or not to, to eat seafood. Um, but I do feel like when we're in these local areas um, that celebrating the work of these fishermen felt really important to us. And we were gifted so many incredible vegetables, all um, organically grown. Uh, and like, we just, we got so sick of hockey after a while. <laughs> <laughs> and um, of hoke what is hoke, this amazing but the fish that Hokkaido is really oh yeah big, yeah yeah <laughs> super expensive in Tokyo restaurants and it was coming out of our ears because everyone was making hoke because it's just everywhere it's in such abundance uh and we stayed with this amazing woman salmon fisher so she goes out early in the morning and she fishes the salmon herself and we barbecued it and it was really beautiful to celebrate the incredible local produce and food, um, this food from the ocean and from the land uh, that, that people had such a close connection with. Yeah. That was really special. As Super Matsuri has written, these, this people's love of the country's culture, really worthy, really helps Japan. I think so. Mm -hmm. I think that embracing of culture, definitely in terms of farming and doing things to a high quality level. Yeah, Absolutely. you can you can see that that uh, yeah, this uh, six thousand yen melons. Absolutely <laughs> high quality. <laughs> wow! Did you buy one? Definitely not. <laughs> I know. I I look at those melons in the store, and I'm like, uh, not today. No. <laughs> No, no, not unless I'm I'm winning the lottery. But you know, sometimes like you'll you'll be at a fancy dinner and they'll have the mustake mushroom, which is so, so expensive. And they'll have just a sliver of it in soup or something. And and you do, I don't know if it's just because the buildup, but you do experience some amazing aromas. But I love mushrooms anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Super Matsuri says, makes me excited and remember my first years of my life in Japan. Thank you for commenting. <laughs> nice. <Thank you. laughs> Let's talk about um, since coronavirus, you've done some workshops. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, I came to Japan at this particular time. This is my seventh time in Japan, my second time living here. Um, to do some research around the bees living in Tokyo area. And then coronavirus happened and I couldn't do the field work that I intended. Uh, but with a bit of creative thinking and collaborating with this amazing woman, uh, Cece from Sustainable Living Tokyo, who I know you've interviewed in the past, uh, we decided to do a research project based around um, how people... Uh, can connect with bees and permaculture and nature from a stay home Tokyo balcony situation. Um, and that evolved into this uh, month long urban gardening course uh, where we um, had 30 incredible humans uh, planting seeds, making compost, learning about the pollinators and other insects that um, that we're living with and, and how to really grow something from seed to harvest in like a one meter, one meter squared in a balcony environment. Um, some, some people were even just working with their windowsills. And uh, so we had weekly uh, Zoom workshops and we've got an ongoing line group. People are still sharing photos and things. It's really fun. Uh, and 
And it, it is really like it comes out of this 2020 coronavirus and a lot of uh, things are going online. A lot of our education and our communication is going online. But something that we can't forget is that we do need uh, we do need our hands in, in soil. We do need that interaction with nature. Um, and nature is everywhere. And we're so lucky that if we have a pot with a bit of soil and a seed, that something will grow. And I think that's really important and really special and something that um, we're really seeing over the world is this growth of home gardening through coronavirus. And so our course and our project is 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 about the lessons that we learnt together uh, around this urban gardening Tokyo project. Yeah. Nice. And you were doing an online survey. Can you tell us about that? Yes, and that's in fact that's ongoing. Please answer our survey. It will really help me uh, actually graduate from my PhD eventually. Um, yeah, so um, I think you've got the picture up there. Yeah, so the idea is um, in order to create really strong environmental education programs, we first need to know how people feel about nature and and insects. And so I'm really curious about uh, how people feel about insects in Japan. The survey is for Japanese speakers. Uh, so if you're a Japanese reader, writer, and can follow the links onto the survey, um, it takes about 10 minutes. And uh, we ask for a little bit about like, do you garden? Like how much time do you spend outside? And then there are a few pictures of some insects and just like how you feel about them. And the results of this survey, um, when we analyze them, will hopefully give us an idea of how people feel about insects here. And then that will really help me design um, curriculum around like insects and gardening and things from there. And it's really exciting research collaborating with um, my supervisor at Hokkaido University, Gaku Kudo. Uh, as well as this amazing researcher at Tokyo University, Masashi Soga, who does this incredible work around the extinction of experience and looking at people in cities. Are we losing touch with nature? Um, so, And then as well as um, Cecilia from Sustainable Living Tokyo. It's an incredible research team. Please answer our survey. That would be great. <laughs> so if people want to do the survey, how should they find it? Ah, so there uh, is a QR code on the flyer that I think you've got a picture of, um, as well as you can go to my website, www.letsbescientists.org uh, forward slash survey. Uh, or if you go to the website, then there's a there's a button. That you can, it says Anketo. It's in Japanese. Uh, do you, no, do you course, have it on the Facebook page as well? Uh, yeah, it's on the it's on my Facebook, uh, it's on my Instagram bio link. Uh, I'll put it up on my Facebook after this interview one more time. <laughs> and um, from the website is the easiest place to find it as well. Okay, great. And did you can you tell us any interesting answers you've had in the survey so far? Oh, or is no. it top yeah. secret? You're gonna have to. You're gonna have to. <laughs> Next no, yeah, that's very important. You got to keep that key information till the <laughs> the big reveal. <laughs> There'll be a big reveal. There'll be a very big reveal. <laughs> uh, during the coronavirus, you've also had some projects, like you planted a garden at your university dorms. Yeah, yeah, that's been a really fun project. Um, so I got back to Hokkaido. Uh, and, you know, stay home. But my home is an international student dormitory with 200 young women, uh, all international students, all who have been kind of like plucked from families and cultures and um, countries. And we're all kind of like thrown together. Uh, and we don't actually have as much contact as one might expect. Um, there are languages flying everywhere. It's a really exciting, engaging environment, but there's not that many opportunities apart from the women living on the same floor to, to um, interact. Uh, and so it was also the start of spring, and I was like, I want to 
I want to plant some seeds. It's springtime. I need to plant some seeds. And uh, convinced the dorm manager to let me take over this, this abandoned lawn behind the dormitory. And we started a community garden. And uh, we just did raised beds. I collected some like leaves and compost and things around, made some compost, dug up some soil, and we just made some really simple, piled on with soil, put some leaves in, chucked some seeds in, put in a few seedlings. Um, and so simple, but what I realized was these, these women who were participating, and you can see it from all the windows. So people would just kind of like come by and like, what are you doing? join in um and for so many of these women we it was the first time that they put their hands in soil it was the first time they touched the soil it's the first time they held a worm um and that just facilitating that experience with people was so 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 beautiful and it really brought us together and it and then we could we could eat the herbs and things we were growing and just just such a beautiful thing that came out of coronavirus was um, us staying home but still being able to connect with the people in our home through gardening. Uh, it was just a magical, magical community gardening experience. That's wonderful. And bees came. So many bees. <laughs> That's great. So what, what were you planting? What kind of seeds? Uh, so we planted uh, lots of leafy greens because if you're a first-time gardener, so for um, anyone interested in trying this at home, um, things like a salad, uh, um, radishes, um, salad, radishes, all sorts of amazing Japanese varieties like Mizuna, um they're so fast and easy to grow you put the seed in the ground and give it some water and it'll grow and then you can kind of you can trim it as you go as well as lots of herbs like basil and rosemary thyme and all these produce lots of tiny a huge abundance of tiny flowers and these are really attractive to bees so by mixing and by mixing these herbs and these delicate leafy greens, um, you're we're attracting, uh, for example, the wasps that will eat the caterpillars that are eating the more sensitive vegetables. So planting a, a diversity, not straight lines of crops, but a bit of a mix of a diversity of different foods that we wanted to eat, as well as herbs. And this combination meant that we were attracting good, beneficial insects. And we were able to eat the abundance of our harvest. Nice. Yeah. And I saw uh, at the farmer's market, you had gotten a beautiful, colorful piece of corn, like popcorn. Yeah. Uh, did you end up planting that into? We uh, we didn't end up planting that one. It's gorgeous. Um, I ended up gifting it to, I ended up gifting the popcorn to different uh, friends who had never seen rainbow corn before. And we had a popcorn party. <laughs> that's um, awesome yeah yeah uh, but another another thing that we planted that was super fun was I have a compost um, on my balcony just made from a styrofoam box with some soil in it and then put in the namagomi the vegetable scraps and just kind of mix it as we go and I'd eaten a pumpkin and I just put my compost scraps of my pumpkin in there and the pumpkin seeds turn into seedlings out of the compost. So then we planted them in the community garden and now we have this huge pumpkin vine growing with little baby pumpkins. So we're That's gonna have awesome. a <laughs> That's awesome. I love when that happens. You have gifts from your compost pile. Um, I I for I seriously have been trying for about two years. Every avocado pit I put it into the ground because I want an avocado tree so badly. And, <laughs> and just this year, I had a seedling come up. So I'm so excited that I actually might have an avocado tree in a, a couple of years. So it, it happens. And I get gifted. Um, like you said, pumpkin is really easy to regenerate from seeds right out of the pumpkin. Uh, tomatoes even from old rotten tomatoes that were in the compost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fantastic. I love it. All my tomatoes have been, oh, whoops, I forgot to eat the tomato. Let's plant it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
So I've got a picture of you at the garden center, and you said you went uh, during coronavirus to buy some flowers. Is that for your apartment balcony? Yeah, yeah. So that was um, about a month before starting the Tokyo Urban Gardening course. I wanted to get my balcony going, so I had a bit of a bit of a this is this is what's possible. Um, so normally I try to plant everything from seed because uh, especially um, uh, organic seeds from companies that are based in a local area. So as I'm living in Japan at the moment, I've been using a company called Atane no Mori, which I'd recommend. They're, um, they're based in permaculture principles and they have beautiful organic seeds. Uh, but because I wanted to kind of get a little bit going, get a head start, uh, so that I could show show people what was possible. Um, I got some seedlings and some flowers to kind of decorate my ba balcony from the garden centre, the local garden centre. And I'd never seen so many flowers. Oh, my goodness. It was very exciting. <laughs> I love going to the garden centre. And my kids roll their eyes like, no, not again. Um, I, I think I'm showing the seed packets right now on the screen. You've got salad mix, bright light chard, Easter egg radish, bush bean mix, and it's not in a plastic bag. I love it. It's like a, a paper biodegradable bag. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And um, again, for any first time gardeners, um, the, these, these four varieties that we chose for the course are really good beginner plants. They're so robust. You can grow all of them on a windowsill, at least to start with, uh, and they will grow. They won't grow in Hokkaido winter, but they'll pretty much, it's best to plant them in spring, but you can kind of, you can push it a little bit forward and back. Um, so, yeah, I really recommend growing those those kinds of varieties. that are, They're really good starting crops. <laughs> That's awesome. And you can eat them. You can eat them. And you they're can. pretty. And they're pretty. I love it. <laughs> Did you do a, a lot of gardening growing up? You talked about community gardens. Mm, I actually, I didn't actually grow up gardening at all. Um, and my mom's actually allergic to bees. Um, so I don't know how I became so obsessed with bees. <laughs> I love you, mom. I think you're watching this. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, I didn't really grow up gardening myself, but my mom uh, tells me this beautiful story about how when I was a baby, she grew all my vegetables that she handmade my baby food with. So she had a beautiful organic garden. Um, and she was yeah growing these vegetables and blending them up. And then one day we went on this camping trip uh, and mum was like, oh gosh, I can't, I, I need to, I need to get us started on some like, you know, tinned, tinned baby food. Cause how are we going to do the camping trip? And I wouldn't eat it. <laughs> like, nah, this isn't my fresh organic vegetables. I'm not into it. Um, so apparently little baby Emily knew the difference. Um, but I really got into gardening uh, at university when I first started at Sydney University in Australia. Uh, I was part of the Environment Collective, doing lots of different environmental activism, thinking about um, forests and the importance of working with Aboriginal communities and uh, fighting for, for environmental justice. And gardening came as one of the really powerful little things that we can do. Um, so much of what we do takes a lot of like energy and fighting for what's right. Um, and that fighting is really important, but also the growing um, can really balance it out. And so we started a community garden at my uni uh, in this space where lots of international students are because there's not really that much connection between the domestic students and the international students. And, uh, yeah, we were growing food on the roof, and I just really saw how it brought us together. And I I had no idea about gardening at that point. I just really liked to eat um, vegetables and herbs. Um, and so that was, that was quite a formative experience for me too, uh, growing, but growing with community. And I think that's really the power of community gardens is that it does bring people 
and that it brings that people care, that fair share and that earth care all together. And then when we're growing with people and for people and for bees, then we're attracting our pollinators. And if we're doing that in an organic way, then we're really attracting all those beneficial insects as well. And we're creating ecology, which, which can be really special in cities. Yeah. So you were talking about activism. I'm showing a picture now of the everybody wearing a bee costume at <laughs> the, what is it? Ex, exterminate. What's the name of the organization? Oh, XR. Yeah. Extinction Rebellion. Yeah. Extinction Rebellion. <laughs> and then in, in Sydney, I think you're doing a pollen, bees bzz, pollinator tour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one, um, that uh, photo, actually, some friends sent me. Um, some of my students from the Let's Be Scientists course attended that rally um, dressed in their bee outfits. And so they sent me that photo of them all dressed up. Uh, and I was in Japan at the time, so I couldn't be part of it. But it was really special to see that the students and my friends that um, had been part of this course and been learning and excited about bees were um, joining that rally and really fighting for pollinators and because because it's all connected. And so that was really special to be sent that photo and be like, oh, yeah. this is having the bees. Awesome. <laughs> and you also visited... Um, students doing a beehive on the roof in Tokyo? Oh, yeah, amazing. Yeah, there's some really cool projects going on in Tokyo. Uh, some really, really cool permaculture projects and some urban beekeeping. So uh, at uh, one of the universities, there are these students as part of a permaculture lab and as part of their class, they're beekeeping. And then they're learning about this beekeeping on the rooftop. And they're also producing honey products, which they're um, selling at markets. And so they can learn like business skills, beekeeping skills, all these skills from this particular beekeeping. Uh, yeah, which, which reminds me another really exciting new project that's happening in Tokyo is the Ikebukuro Community Garden. I don't know if you've got a picture about that already. No, not yet. Yeah, so uh, recently the city of Ikebukuro, um, in partnership with Surf Media Communications, has um, opened up this big, huge park in the middle of Ikebukuro. It's opened. I highly encourage people to go check it out. Um, and uh, later this year, probably at the end of this year, we'll be opening the community garden. And so I'm the permaculture designer for that community garden. And it will be, because because I'm involved, it will be very centred around pollinators. <laughs> we want to make a beautiful bee-friendly garden. Uh, but the idea is because it's a community garden that um, it's a space where people can come, they can be, they can uh, garden, work together, learn about different urban gardening techniques. And all the compost from the cafe nearby will be working with the community garden and um, working with the park to create this beautiful space for people to, especially for first time gardeners, to kind of get a little bit of an idea and learn about bees, have a kid friendly space. Yeah. Um, I think it's called Ikesan in Ikebukuro. So, yeah, definitely check it out. Check out the park, which is open now, and the community garden, which will be open at the end of the year. <laughs> That's really exciting. Yeah, I love that. I love um, taking na nature, taking, well, people allowing nature to take concrete spaces back or take uh, like where people have taken over and let nature take it back. And we've, we've actually seen some great examples of that during coronavirus, haven't we? Mm, where, absolutely. you know, yeah. people, people just aren't there. So we see deer walking down main street or, <laughs> you know, we saw police chasing the Inushishi down areas, right? Because the, the animals are coming back, the plants are growing more. Um, maybe this isn't a bad thing. Maybe we should encourage nature to take over a little bit more in our lives, right? <laughs> and I think that's a really um, that's a really good point about um, yeah, nature in cities and urban ecology is that um, often we think of cities as these barren concrete jungles. But uh, when we look closer, uh, there are weeds and those 
weeds like dandelion and clover, they're actually um, they're breaking up the soil and making it richer so that the next generation of plants can grow. Um, the flowers are attracting insects. Uh, there's um, little uh, yeah weeds and sunsai, the wild vegetables that kind of always grow along creek lines and rivers. And wherever there's water, there'll be biodiversity. Wherever there's weeds, there'll be biodiversity. There's a tiny bit of soil. Um, a plant will find it and it will grow. <laughs> so our cities can actually be these really thriving spaces. And like you mentioned, if we just leave just a little bit, um, then, then we do get these animals and creatures that will come and use those spaces. And we can too. Um, it's about putting on those, it's about putting on those goggles and seeing the nature right at our doorstep. Absolutely, and seeing potential for nature. Like now, when I'm walking around town, I I see a little slab of concrete next to the walkway, and I know it doesn't need to be there. Wouldn't that be nice if there was a tree there? That would be lovely if there was a tree there or a bush or something. And yeah. then if I talk to someone from the local town planning committee, I might mention, oh, that would be lovely if there was a little tree there, you know? So <laughs> just being positive and uh, using our soft power to try to softly push things in the right direction when we see potential. I think that's, that's the kind of thing you're doing so beautifully. Thank you. And I'm, I'm really inspired um, being in Japan as well in that, uh, people really do celebrate, for example, hanami, the cherry blossom viewing, is one of the oldest traditions in Japan. And it is, at its core, it's just this celebration of a tree blooming beautiful, beautiful pink flowers. And because of that, um, people have planted cherry blossoms all over, all over cities and in all different places. And then in springtime, uh, people gather and have picnics and parties and barbecues because there's a flower blooming like that's that's the core of it and I think that's a really special and a really beautiful beautiful culture that really inspires me in this work as well that is it's fantastic we and there's a lot not just cherry blossoms people will go out and see sunflower fields or wisteria as well so it's a great part of Japanese culture isn't it yeah beautiful. so we have just a few more minutes do you have another song that you could leave us with Oh, I always have time for another song. Um, the, I might play the song that I opened with. You got a little taster. Um, this one is uh, the second song I ever wrote. Uh, and it, the idea is thinking about, like, who is an ecologist? Like, I am at a university. I'm studying ecology, but... I know that really it's people who are who are living and interacting with the nature at our doorstep. That's 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 who ecologists are. Uh, and so I wrote this song to kind of share that a little bit. Take it away. And for those Japanese speakers, I have actually translated this one into Japanese. So if you go into my YouTube, please subscribe to my YouTube. That'd be great. <laughs> um, then you can find the Japanese version as well. an ecologist a person that sees that there's a buzzing in the blossoms of trees they ask a question and they follow it through signing an experiment that someone else could do too who's an ecologist a woman walking the land she knows a country the scats and scratch in the sand she names the seasons but she knows when the whales swim north the waters bloom trees blow in the wind oh follow our curiosities making a hypothesis we can be ecologist too testing now who's on our mind amazing what we find ecology is for me and you who's an ecologist it's putting scraps in your compost gets all smelly because it's nitrogen rich you add some carbon with some leaves off the street you churn it up and gets real hot and starts smelling sweet who's an ecologist a farmer into cropping they grow the sun to fix that nitrogen they rotate chicken so with the scratching and poo they turn over the sofa of a place to grow to oh follow curiosities making a hypothesis we can be ecologists too testing now what's on our mind analyzing 
what we find in college it used to be and you. Lovely. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's awesome. And the first song, singer-songwriter who's performed on the series. I love it. Oh, yes. <laughs> A day of first. <laughs> A day of first, for sure. Um, so if you're watching, thank you so much for your comments and questions and joining us today. Uh, check out Amelia Ecology on Instagram, Facebook, and her website, letsbescientists.org. Yeah. YouTube, that'd be awesome. Yes, subscribe to YouTube. Trying to get her subscribed. <laughs> I, will, I will put all the links below. So hopefully people will go and support you and your wonderful efforts to support the pollinators. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining. Have a good day. See you again tomorrow at nine o'clock. Tomorrow is our 100th episode of the Seeking Sustainability Live. So we'll see you tomorrow at nine. Take care everyone. Bye.